Today, cycling a saltwater tank, what are you leaving on the table? We have the 10 questions you didn't know to ask until now. This is BRS TV Answers. If you're about to cycle a reef tank or a saltwater aquarium, or even maybe right in the middle of it, these are the questions that today's reefers are asking and the answers starting with number one. Is today's saltwater aquarium cycle only about ammonia? And the answer is no. We're learning more about biome, which is a you know, bacteria in the aquarium, the nitrogen cycle, a source of uh, naturally occurring organisms, copepods, amphipods, things like that. Coralline algae, microfauna, uh, minimal amount of pests, you know, all these different types of things are things to consider in the cycle. It's not just about getting your little ammonia test kit out and, and once you read no ammonia, you're ready to go. There's a lot more that goes into it and we're learning more and more each day. Just wrap your head around more than ammonia. I think this is an artifact of an older time. Yeah. Uh, back when everybody was using live rock that got pulled out of the ocean, it just kind of came with bio. <laughs> it had coralline algae, it had pods, it had all of these different things on it and you just didn't really have to worry about it. Yeah. I just had to make sure that the ammonia wouldn't kill my fish. Today's world, now we're all using various forms of dry rock, so these things don't really come with a lot of really anything on it other than rock. Uh, and so, yes, we have to save the fish from toxic ammonia, mm -hmm. but there's also all kinds of critters that live on the rock that eat the algae before you'd ever even see it. There's bacteria that outcompete other negative bacteria like cyano yeah. or uh, diatoms or dinos. So there's so many more things that goes into you know cycling, properly cycling a tank than just whether or not you're talking about ammonia. That's today's conversation because the tools that we use have changed. All right, number two, probably the most commonly asked question about cycling a tank in biome, how do I get that coralline algae to grow? Purple right. stuff. Right, <laughs> yes, uh, the purple stuff obviously looks really nice mm -hmm. when it coats the tank, but more than that, it actually prevents all the algae from rooting, it prevents a lot of slimes from taking over. It's just a really, really healthy thing to be growing in there. In fact, if you can see it growing rapidly, you know you're doing something right, and that the corals will probably thrive as well. So the rocket fuel for that seems to be a stable alkalinity, at least mm -hmm. of nine, having a high pH, at least eight, shooting for 8.3, and lower light as well. It actually doesn't grow as fast in really high light yep. in our cases. In fact, we've seen it take over tanks here with just the like office lights like 10 par. <laughs> Uh, and in that low par also, you're giving it an opportunity to thrive in there without having to compete all of that algae. Mm -hmm. So those are all the tips to make sure that you can grow coal and algae and help get that element of the biome mastered while you're cycling the tank. Question number three, what is the most common way to ruin your cycle? And the answer is turning your lights on. And that's not just turning your lights on, but turning them on extremely high, full blast. Uh, we all have this urge to crank some lights on. We think that uh, you know, the critters in the tank need light, but what actually needs light more is the photosynthetic pests like algae and you know, bacteria, diatoms, these types of things that will uh, send you into pulling your hair out all because you turned your lights up too far. We just told you in the last one that coralline algae can grow at very, very minimal light and uh, that actually outcompete some of those photosynthetic algae. So keep your lights low and don't pull your hair out. A lot of the beneficial bacteria, the copepods, the amphipods, a lot of the things that we actually want to take over the surface of the rock and create that biome is actually going to like thrive on organics. Mm -hmm. I mean, they gotta go like find sources of food, they gotta like digest it, they gotta turn it into energy, and it all just happens really slow. Yeah. So they're just not going to take over the surface of the rock as fast as we would like. However, the flip side of that, the cyanos of the world, the dinos of the world, the hair algaes, the bryopsis, all those kinds of things, like energy from light, they're able to capture and convert so fast. And when you crank up the light, you crank up the growth and they <laughs> outcompete all the things that have to uh, uh, rely on organics for growth. So hitting that light, cranking it up. If you're gonna turn on your SPS tank and you're gonna crank it up to you know 350 par like day one, uh, sometimes that works, other times, man, it will go totally awry. So you might want to 
like start ramping up. Use those acclimation modes and just mm -hmm. ramp the light up really slowly. Give time to those things, those organic things, the coralline algae, the copepods, amphipods, and all the beneficial bacteria to outcompete the pests. All right, number four, does the acclimation mode on my lights actually help me reduce the chances I'm gonna run into all these pests? Yeah, the answer is yes, yeah, yes and no. I would use the acclimation mode, but uh, I would use it in a longer period of time. A lot of those acclimation modes maybe have you ramp up for a week or so, but you can have some of them you can extend out probably to a month while your first initial cycle is the way to go and start, start it very, very low. I would definitely use at least a month to, mm -hmm. to ramp it up. And even then, probably ramp it up just from zero to uh, LPS over the course yep. of that first month. And remember, actually, that anything you run into, when you see anything photosynthetic take over the tank, just turn the lights off, yep. man. And they'll <laughs> set them all back, and you don't have to really worry about it. Just reset the acclimation, acclimation mode, and it allows you to find your way to where you're going without having to constantly update the light. Questions number five is what's this green spot? What's this purple spot? What's this brown spot? What's this? You know, what's this dusting? And a lot of the answers to you know, should you interject in some of these things that you're seeing? Uh, most of the time, the answer is no. Just leave it alone, and it will work itself out. The cycle is just going to happen. It's called we call it the ugly brown phase, but sometimes just embrace that it's going to happen. I mean, sometimes you roll a dice and you hit Yahtzee and, uh, <laughs> you know, first try and you just start it up and you just don't run into anything. There's the other 99.9% .9 of you that will get a patch of cyano, that will get some green film growing on the rock, uh, that will get all kinds of different things that will happen in the tank. But often it, it's just part of the ebb and flow of the tank. And so unless something's really totally going awry, knee jerk for me mm. is actually just leave it alone and let it play out its course. Number six, what if I hate seeing all those spots anyway and I can't help myself? The answer is purple rock. This stuff is made for you. If this is your first rodeo and you just can't handle the fact that there's going to be some red or some green or something growing in the rock, well, the purple stuff not only seems to actually not grow as much of it, but it doesn't really matter because you can't even see it on there. So <laughs> if there's a little bit of algae growing on here, a little green film or a little red film, you can't actually see it growing on the real reef rock or even the carob sea lighter purple stuff. So if this is your first rodeo, your patience is uh, kind of low, which is true of almost every new reefer, purple rock will maybe have the same problems as the white rock, you just never know. Question number seven, should I cycle each individual piece of rock in a bucket before I aquascape it and then put it in my tank? Answer if today's reefer is no. Take the opportunity while the rock is dry, build your aquascape, break it up, glue it together. You, you can use epoxies and mortars much easier and when the rock is dry. Once you have your aquascape built, throw it in the tank to cycle or even throw it in a trash can to cycle. Yeah, I would always do that now. I just build out my aquascape, cycle it right in the tank, cycle it in a horse trough, cycle it in whatever container you want. But build the aquascape first into one a structure and then cycle that because if I cycle the rock and uh, I spent two months getting it covered in the right biome and bacteria and then I go to build my elaborate aquascape and then it dries out and everything just dies, that was a giant waste of time. Yeah. Uh, the only uh, thing I would say about this is 99% of you are going to be using some form of dry rock. If you happen to have spent the $20 a pound uh, for a live rock and you even found a proper source for it, in that case, you probably do want to cycle or cook it or cure it inside of some bin mm -hmm. to let some of the organics die off first. Uh, in that case, keep it alive. Don't let it dry out because that's what you paid that $20 a pound for. Number eight, how do I actually add biome to the tank? And biome is a big word. So there's a lot of different sources for this type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, ocean direct sand here is sand that has actually come out of the ocean in a breathable bag. It's never been sifted. It's moist in here and marketed as has the biome of the ocean. And I will tell you that uh, we have recently done some aqua biomics tests to actually prove that it does do that. <laughs> yes, it does. I was really, really surprised that it actually maintained better than, uh, even just after a month, better than more than half of the tanks out there that they've tested. So uh, the Ocean Direct bringing the biome, but you also have things like the life source from Aquaforce, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. mud that comes out of Fiji. Uh, you also have things like a piece of live rock or rubble from established tanks. 
Those things don't add as much, but you can even add a couple scoops of sand. These things will bring different things to the tank, but my choice is actually <laughs> right now these uh, ocean directs and the yep. muds because what they'll do is they'll bring bacteria and stuff, but they don't bring all the funky algaes that you don't want that come out of established tanks or live rock as well. So think about all those. And then beyond that, coralline in a bottle, coralline scrubbed off a rock, copepods in a bottle, all those things will get you where you need to go. Question number nine, do these bacterial bottles or bacterial starter supplements have all the biome already I need? And the answer is, we are in the middle of testing that. So come back later, we'll uh, have an answer for you. We've tested <laughs> or used, I should say, a lot of different products out there. All of the KZ stuff that mm -hmm. people have used for decades. We talk about uh, the uh, Microbacter 7 Dr. from Tim's. Brightwell. Dr. Yeah. Tim's got all these mm -hmm. setup things. Uh, there's a little Prodibio stuff. Like there's all kinds of different you know solutions for adding bacteria and biome to the tank. How well do they work? Well, anecdotally, really well. Yeah. Uh, but what I'd like to do is actually test them. So uh, I think in probably the next three months or so, if you're watching this later on, you'll probably already be able to go find it. But we're gonna find out what the biome in a bottle actually does and which ones work the best. Number ten obviously leading right up to this one. What's the best way to cycle? This answer actually changes all the time as we learn more and more about our mm -hmm. tanks and the highest percentage pass. But if you ask me right now, it'd be one month, no light, yep. one month LPS light, and then if I was going SPS after that, I'd slowly ramp it up using an acclimation cycle from there. Uh, just giving it time to grow all the beneficial things at that you know 75 to 150 par for mm -hmm. that second month before I go all the way up to 350. Now the important part of that is uh, you actually need a par number of meter to be able to know what yeah. those zones are. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know what? that cycle I just described is about two months long. So it sure is convenient that you can return the power meter that you buy from BRS <laughs> for up to 60 days. A yeah. uh, small restocking fee, but it gives you an opportunity to use a really cool tool to get this right and know that you got this thing really down pat, doing it the best you possibly can. Okay, so the one question that we didn't ask today is can the human eye actually measure par? We tested on this on six pro reefers, including one that tests lighting for a living. <laughs> Find out how close the human eye can get right here. 